Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nyesh. It's my pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank you personally and the, the foundation and the program committee of the Academia Engelberg. The main culture I was raised in is the academic culture, uh, and what I will talk is mainly thoughts about just war and just peace. Uh, and I chose this topic in the spirit of what Alexei Keller was uh, supposed to, to say or what you expected from him, I think, but also in the spirit of, of this morning's session and in the spirit, if I may say, of the location, which is why, for those of you who are in the back, of course, you cannot read Wordsworth, a uh, beautiful poem about this city, which I read before coming here, uh, which he wrote uh, when he was here in the year 800, 1820. Uh, maybe, maybe the organizers will put it on their website and you can read it then, or you just type in Engelberg and Angels and, and Wordsworth and you immediately get the poem on the internet. Now, the, uh, my talk, and I, I really believe in, in discussion because I think we should all benefit uh, from from uh, an occasion, and in that sense, I should also benefit from the talk and not just give you what I prefer beforehand. So I will probably go quite fast because we're already quite late in the schedule of this morning, and coming from Geneva, of course, I should be a perfect timekeeper. So I should finish. Uh, uh, I should finish before. 10 past 11, which is my allotted time, which is half an hour, including the discussion. Uh, but I, 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 have, I do not have the privilege of having a young scientist uh, address uh, my thoughts. I regret it. But uh, I'm sure uh, some of you will ask questions, or, which is even more interesting, raise criticisms. So in the spirit of the location here, just a very few rapid words about Christian attitudes to war. Then I'll very quickly go into just war, uh, not because uh, the preceding speaker, Angelo Gnedinger, uh, uh, covered the whole subject, of course not. Uh, the Geneva Convention is hundreds and hundreds of articles and pages. Uh, but it's to give you sort of the background, the philosophical background and the also legal and historical background of trying to limit war. And then thirdly, and this would be my main point here, because this is the last day of this uh, beautiful conference, will be to extend sort of our discussion in the light of what we have heard, especially yesterday, uh, in this concept that Alexei Keller and I have developed that we have entitled Just Peace. And we will, I'll do that because Just Peace, surprisingly, has not been really much thought about or thought of or developed from a conceptual point of view in the scientific literature. You have hundreds, thousands of works on just war. Everybody talks about just peace, but what is a just peace? So we, we have some, some alternative, I think, uh, viewpoints on that. Theologians have worked on just peace, yes, because scientists have very little uh, experience uh, handling that concept, even though, of course, everybody knows what justice is, and everybody would like peace, or most everybody would usually like peace, especially in bourgeois Switzerland. So very quickly, and I'm sorry, it will be, it will be maybe a, a quick film rather than a slide-by-slide -slide, uh, presentation, but very quickly I'll just comment uh, what is in front of you, uh, Christian attitudes to war. Basically you can find in, in the Ancient Testament, but also the New Testament, you can also find it, of course, in, in the Quran and, and of course in, in the Torah. Uh, uh, there are basically three attitudes, especially for Christian, Christianism, that there is somewhat specific and separate to some extent, three attitudes towards war. Militarism, pacifism, and just war. Just war is between militarism and pacifism. But let us forget militarism, not because of W and uh, the war of 2003, which was in many ways a militaristic sort of adventure. Uh, as you all know, 
Bush had the unfortunate use of the word crusade a few days after September 11, but it is, I think, revealing, and it does go in that direction. So uh, for, for militarists, that's one attitude towards war. War is a good thing, because war, go, war is for glory. War is something that is important for honor. In that sense, in some societies, in war-making societies, it's, of course, a, a good thing. And the holy war is even better, because you don't only fight a war where you get glory, but you also uh, help the, the, your the extended uh, arm uh, with, a, with a weapon, of course, uh, of God's will. Uh, so the holy war against infidels and unbelievables, un unbelievers, sorry, soldiers of Christ is the Crusades, or the more recent patriotic uh, dulce decorum es pro patria mori, how sweet and honorable it is to die for one's country. That was, of course, the idea, especially in July and August 1914, but just a few months later, that attitude dramatically changed. And uh, we heard some, some elements about that this morning. Now, pacifism, pacifism uh, is, is really closely linked to, to Christianity. And the early Christians were not all pacifists, but most were pacifists for all sorts of reasons. And you can find, you can find some of the best exemplifications of the pacifist credo, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, which I have here. Just one interesting argument against pacifism, we cannot discuss it here, maybe in the questions we can raise, somebody wants to raise the issue, we can discuss it and put it in the, in the background of all I'm going to say, uh, is an argument uh, in, in probably the, certainly I would say, the, the best uh, sort of analysis or current contemporary analysis of just war theory, uh, which is the, the book by Michael Watson, 1977, uh, which uh, attempts to provide a general best interpretation of what that theory is, taking international law, taking in especially, especially taking into account, this is Waltz's method, taking into account the hypocrisy that you have uh, when you look at, uh, at wars. In other words, just war for Michael Waltz uh, exists as a, as a theory uh, and as a doctrine, uh, not so much because it is always followed, but because the lies that soldiers and statesmen tell shows, because these are lies, and they know that they are lies, how hypocritical they are. In the sense that when, when Milosevic, I, I remember he made a speech in, in uh, uh, to inaugurating, I think, the reconstruction of a bridge, I think it was in Banja Luka, I read that in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, I, I, I haven't been able to find the speech. If somebody has, has the speech, I'll be delighted to read it. And he said, well, we know, we Serbs, we know that we went, to, we went to, to war, we defended our country, we defended our identity, we defended our nation, our peoples. But those who, 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 who destroyed this bridge in particular, you know, they, they don't sleep at night, they have problems, they have a guilty conscience. So the fact that Milosevic, this is Waltz's point, methodological point, the fact that Milosevic himself knows, and even, even if he's a psychopath or sociopath, and I let others uh, make that, that, that analysis from an empirical point of view, even if he knows that maybe it's just these, these, these questions of morality, ethics, of, of values, is just something that he uses, maybe for his own ends, personal, very personal ends, he still knows that other people do not behave only according to their own personal interest. So in that sense, he's hypocritical. And this is, this is where, as Walter writes it, the lineaments of justice uh, are to be found. Uh, and this is the critique we also, of course, have against uh, Tony Blair and the approach that we have, or we when I say we, I mean, of course, collectively, we have, not just individually, Tony Blair, we have of, uh, of a specific war where we cannot always uh, look at only our own point of view, but have to take uh, our country's point of view into account. So, so Waltz's, Waltz's criticism against, against uh, uh, pacifism uh, is, 
is, for example, he doesn't develop this very much, uh, is, for example, uh, that, that uh, Gandhi, Gandhi's discussion, there's some letters between Gandhi and Martin Buber uh, that, uh, as Walzer writes, uh, the, the perverse advice he gave to the Jews of Germany that they should commit suicide rather than fight back against Nazi tyranny. Here, nonviolence under extreme conditions collapses into violence directed at oneself rather than at one's murderers. And therefore, his position and the traditional position, and the one which is accepted even by Henri Dunant indirectly, and he was criticized because of that, is just war. Let's make war more humane. The fact is, if you have something awful, you make it more humane, then you can be exposed to the criticism that the more humane it is, the more it will be used. But you're in a quandary. What can you do? The extreme pacifist actually accepts that innocent people will die. So that's what the extreme pacifist accepts. So in that sense, I don't think personally, but this is a personal decision, of course, I don't think this is the right, uh, the right attitude. So let me go very quickly, as I said, it's, uh, sorry, it's a film, it's a fast, fast forward film, uh, rather, it's almost a movie, but uh, uh, I, th I, th I want to go, I want to go to what I think, given also what Mr. Gremino will tell us, what will be interesting in the context of this morning's spirit in this morning's session. Now, one quick point, when one has to discriminate between what is called violence, the, the, the theme here, the general theme or the word that is used uh, here, and force. Violence is not force. Violence is, in general, an unconstrained infliction of pain and destruction, but which is unconstrained, whereas force uh, is a constrained infliction of pain and destruction. And coercive force is the possibility of force being used, but not necessarily being used. And uh, in that sense, force has a use uh, from a virtual point of view. It is a purpose. It is not, it is not the necessarily what is going to happen as when you when you threaten uh, uh, someone or a country threatens another country and as a consequence uh, uh, it deters the other country from doing some, some things that it might do otherwise. Well, the doctrine of just war is basically, that's the, that's the and there have been some recent criticisms of that, basically two bodies of uh, uh, knowledge of sets of rules that normatively seek to uh, organize uh, violence at the international level in order to minimize it. The one is the jus ad bellum rules, that is, the, that is the examining whether or not in a specific case you have the right to use war as a means for something. So whether you go to war or not, a binary decision, do you have the right to go to this extreme violence uh, even though it is force organized uh, we'll see that later, or not. Would you go to war against the United States to defend the Swiss banking secret, to give a, an example taken from, uh, from the mountains? The second element is the use in bello. These are, once you have a war, how do you fight it? What are the rules that you should obey uh, in, in fighting a war? Is, is, is it anything goes? Uh, is it the Sinatra doctrine that anything goes, you can do whatever you want, or do you, even in that circumstance, do you have to limit yourself? Well, actually with Plato already, and in some sense already with the ancient Assyrians, Sumerians, and Egyptians, there are already there some, some elements of, of sort of preventing not the most extreme things, but not doing to, to other human beings what you would do to a stone that you would sort of kick away uh, for your own pleasure, in the sense that there are some limitations already uh, 3,000 no, or 5,000 years ago in that sense. Juspos bellum I will not talk about, but this is something very recently developed, not very well uh, yet. So all this discussion of transitional justice and all the other uh, name tags and uh, approaches and paradigms that can be given to that. 
and so I just put this in two brackets because it's really not developed and I will not talk about that. And what is essential to understand is that for a just war to be called just, you have to satisfy both all the requirements of the use at Bellum and all the requirements of the use in Bellum. And as always, when you have an ideal case, you rarely have a historical or empirical case which satisfies those conditions. World War II is usually seen from the Allied perspective as a just war. Now, the way Allied have fought the war, Dresden, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and so forth, there, of course, you have an undiscriminating use of force. And while, uh, for instance, Michael Walzer accepts that the bombing of German cities was, was something that was just, what was acceptable when Britain was really at the, at the very sort of end or very, very much inside the abyss of, of its, of its, of its uh, uh, sort of loss. Uh, uh, this is something which is, which is debatable and should be debated, the, the issue of just war theorists. And here you see, for those of you who know Michael Walsh's work, here I am quite close to Michael Walsh in the sense that what is important is to debate to debate it, not that we all have the same definition of what individual wars are just or not just, or how unjust specific wars are or not. There, there is disagreement, but the question that we discuss it is the main question because it is in discussing, it is in dialogue, it is in advancing uh, towards truth, as Gandhi would say, that uh, we move uh, ahead. So very quickly, and there I will accelerate, very quickly, jus ad bellum, uh, the, the, the first element, the first of the six rules that it usually constitu constitutes the jus ad bellum, to use a war, you have to have a just cause. In St. Augustine, of course, uh, writing as he was in the times when Rome the Rome, the Christian Rome, was attacked by barbarians from, from the north, by vandals and others. Of course, St. Augustine, uh, in, in a letter actually, uh, writes that war is waged in order that peace may be obtained. So you wage war to have peace. You don't wage war to have war. You wage war to have peace. Uh, you wage war in sort of the more modern jargonful way of expressing things, you wage war to come back to the status quo ante, not to, to better the world, but at least to eliminate the, the, the bad that is in a specific aggression, uh, in a specific uh, war. So of course, self-defense, that's a traditional just cause, but it must be said that it is only recently, really, that the doctrine has included what could also be called more from a sort of uh, traditional point of view, the, what is called the protection of the innocence, that is, a humanitarian intervention. Why not die for Kosovo? Kosovo, sorry. The second rule is legitimate leadership. War is undertaken and waged exclusively by the leaders of the state or the community. Why is that so? That to eliminate, of course, in the doctrine, private wars. You do not have a king just making war for his, his own pleasure or for uh, aggrand aggrandizing, for instance, his, his personal power, the power of his family. Uh, no, you, 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 have, you have legitimate leadership, so when you have a king, of course, by definition, it's legitimate in ancient times, but it is, as you know, with Jean Baudin and others, the king is also at the service of the community, of the state. That's why when the king of France dies, you say, le roi est mort, and you say immediately, vive le roi, because le roi ne meurt jamais. When, when, one, when one king dies, his son, typically, uh, takes over. In that sense, the king is always there because the king represents the perpetual uh, sort of contract, uh, the perpetual nation uh, of a given human community. 
you need a formal declaration of war. You can't just go, oops, you know, I just went into war. No, you have to say, I'm going to use war as a means. I'm going to defend myself. I'm going ahead. It has to be a last resort. There's a big discussion, of course, and this is always tracing a line in the sand. You know, could you have one more diplomatic uh, sort of move before going to war? How far do you have to go? And this is a matter of discussion, of controversy. But certainly, if you always have to go one more mile, then you never go to war. So in some sense, at one point, war becomes legitimate when it is a last resort. You have to have a reasonable hope of success in the sense that using war that is defending yourself when, there's, when it doesn't make sense to defend yourself is not a just war. In that sense, if I may say, the war of the, uh, the, the possible war that did not happen the possible beginning of World War II that we do not know as the beginning of World War II was, of course, in March 1939, when Hitler uh, violated the Munich agreements and uh, took possession also with his troops uh, when uh, Germany's th Third Reich took possession of what remained of uh, the Czechoslovak Republic. War did not happen because in war, I'm sorry to make this analogy, it's just like in, in love or in tango, you have to be two. Now, of course, on September 1st, 1939, you had a second partner. You had Poland as a partner. Then you had a war. And the sixth and final uh, requirement is macro proportionality. The evil and damage of war must be proportionate to the injustice that led to it in the sense that uh, you do not use war uh, for a, some trivial uh, national interest. Now, the question of the use in Bello which is not totally sort of exemplified here. Okay, so who gets to tell him he's a war criminal? Uh, the issue of the use in bello, or rather the, re the rules in, of the use in bello are, are two, sometimes only one, which is the immunity of the innocent, that is non-combatants, civilians, uh, my, uh, women and children, sort of typically, quote unquote, should not be targeted with armed force, but also what has become, uh, what that's, you don't find it every time, but almost every time in all the works there, you need what is what I call micro-proportionality in the sense that the way you wage war has to be proportional to the grander means of using war and to, to, the, to the just cause. To give just a specific example, do you have the right, to take again the Kosovo case, do you have the right to have pilots who are so high up uh, and who just uh, destroy things on the ground during the Kosovo war, do you have the right to do that? Is, it, is that proportional? Should you not send troops on the ground, actually troops which, would, which could have maybe prevented, but I think you know much more about that, that, that could be discussed, but, uh, uh, that could have been maybe prevented, or at least the threat of sending troops could have maybe prevented some atrocities, but saying that we will only bombard you but will not send troops, that's, that's, a, that's a moral problem, not just a strategic problem, it's also a moral problem. So this is, this is the, this is the uh, use ad bellum and use in bello, these are the use ad bellum and use in bello rules, these eight rules, and they're all necessary for a just war to be called just, and together, if they're all satisfied, then the just war, then the war that you look at, satisfying these eight rules, will be can be deemed as just. So you see, in that sense, you have the situation here, uh, where this uh, young and beautiful uh, lady says, "I'd know." That's who would know. Uh, you have the situation where you sort of imply that there is a conscience and that you would not do some things you would not do. Uh, uh, because you have a conscience, even though nobody else is here and watching. Because as you saw, those eight rules are independent of third parties. So now I want to change dramatically the focus by going into what could in some sense be called a use ad bellum, what, which is definitely not a use ad bellum in the same line as the use uh, ad bellum and the use in bello, uh, use, no, not ad bellum, the use uh, post bellum, sorry, just peace is in, is in the line of a use post bellum, but 
uh, here we have a break with respect to what I just uh, presented to you. And this is what uh, my, my friend and colleague Alexi Keller and I uh, have developed and have worked on and are continuing now more than ever uh, to work on now, especially from a historical empirical point of view. Now, just peace, we take from just war theory uh, some methodological or formal elements which are similar. We also have necessary and sufficient conditions. There are four, uh, and I will go into them. But unlike just war, we have a processual, a processual definition that is, we look at the process, whereas in just war you sort of satisfy, sort of tick off the, 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 the checklist, and if you, if you, if the checklist, uh, if the, in the end you have ticked off all the checklist, well then you can, for instance, if you're a plane pilot, then you have the right, of course, to, to, start, uh, to start the engines, or rather to, to start rolling to, to take off. Well, we look at just peace as a process, not as a number of sort of independent normative considerations that need to be uh, followed in order for the peace to uh, be allowed to carry the tag just. The four... Uh, necessary conditions are the following. The first one is what we call thin recognition. Thin recognition is, is at the individual level, but here we're at, we're at the collective level, of course, but at the individual level, it is close to what uh, Immanuel Kant calls the Weltbürgerrecht, his, his, third, his third condition for perpetual peace. Uh, that is that individuals have the right to visit each other without being killed, in particular, of course, this was, uh, this was the liberal creed, which is not, uh, which I think is, 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 a, is, a, is, a true, is a correct one, that uh, commerce would help in bringing uh, people, uh, individuals, and also countries, peoples together. So thin recognition is basically that you recognize others as agents, as autonomous ent entities that have a particular identity, a history, a culture, and, and usually their own language. We are, of course, in Switzerland, the main, one of the main exceptions to that. In other words, they accept each other as collectives of human beings and also as key for solving the conflict. So this is our first condition. The second one is thick recognition. And there we are much more in line of what we discussed uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, thick recognition implies for us this concept that you have a mutual empathy of the identity ties of the other, that is, of the needs of the other. You understand the other. It doesn't mean that you love the other. You have empathy, not necessarily sympathy but you understand the other, the other as an agent, and here's a collective agent, in that sense as a political agent. What does each need to remain satisfied, uh, that is to remain self? The second point in this respect is to take what is called commonly as red lines, things that you cannot go beyond, because you cannot cross those red lines, you cannot cross those lines without challenging the very existence of the other, of the other party that you are uh, uh, in, in touch with and discussing with or, or in conflict with. What is important to stress is that this does not mean that there's an overall consensus between parties. Actually, as you know from, from diplomacy, you usually and it is an important element, you choose to disagree. But choosing to disagree does not mean that you do not understand what the other's position is. And actually, if you present the other, uh, her or his position, as well as he could present it himself, but then say, but I do not agree with that position, there is, there is this empathy that is there, 
and, uh, and that's already positive, but there's no requirement that you really love the other in the Christian sense of the term, if I may use that, uh, that uh, uh, thought. It also does not mean that you require uh, some societal consensus as the one that anthropologists have, have written about, that you have long palabras, you discuss and discuss under the tree, and finally the, the 60 or 80 or 100 uh, uh, members of a community in a, in a tropical forest would, would agree, and if one of them really raises an objection, especially if it is an important member of the community. And, and the, the third element, and this is the crucial element, and we come back to some of the elements of some of the things that we discussed uh, uh, yesterday, uh, especially in, in terms of narratives and others, that it is important to realize that despite the rigidities, identities are potentially changeable. And in fact, they are negotiable because they're not inherently zero sum. It's not because I, am, I want to be like this that necessarily I do not, or this prevents the other of being different. Sometimes, yes, territories are usually zero sum but not necessarily. And identities can be redefined because they are, to a large extent, constructed out of real experiences, and these experiences can be presented and ordered in different ways. Also in negative ways, as we, as we heard uh, earlier, because, okay, our children will not fight the war of which we, we just finished fighting now, but our grandchildren will fight the war. We will jump a generation, as you mentioned earlier. And then finally, and this is crucial, it is usually forgotten, including in, in, in advanced treatments of, of negotiation theories in, in political science such as game theory, it is not sufficient to understand the other. It is just as important to understand oneself. That is to understand the political, political being of the party you, 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 you negotiate for if you are the negotiator or the, or the mediator if you are a third party that intervenes. For example, is Israel a democratic Jewish nation state? Or is it a democratic Jewish nation state? Is it a democratic Jewish nation state? Or is it, I mean, I let you go on and on, and there are other words you could use. But this is, of course, central to the uh, self-definition, and that is to the solution to a conflict, not just to look at the other, what everybody tells you you should do, but also to look at yourself and what is acceptable for your own people. Thirdly, and I'm almost finished, thirdly, we have a, a renouncement. Now, we argue against uh, sort of the, the, the Roger Fisher approach and other approaches that talk about win-win. All can win. You just, you know, just discuss things and you increase the size of the pie and then, in the end, everyone wins. Well, we think this is not the way things go, uh, that you have to have what we call renouncement. Renouncement, why? Well, mainly for credibility purposes, for really making that step and showing that you're willing uh, to make peace, and you're, sh you're showing this willingness, not just but by, by what you say, words are cheap, but what, what, by what you do. In other words, concessions and compromises are necessary. Sacrifices are needed because they show sincerity, and you have to abandon some symbols, some positions, some advantages. You have to sacrifice them. It has to hurt to some extent. You cannot have just peace on the cheap. In other words, it is a human experience. It requires a visible and obvious rapprochement on the human level. And finally, after thin recognition, thick recognition, renouncement, the fourth necessary, and with the three preceding ones, condition, uh, you have rule. Rule in the generic sense of common principles, norms, procedures, accepted behaviors. It could be a regime in terms of political science, international relations, uh, neorealist, neoliberal, sorry, theory, or other, other elements of that sort. Rule in the generic sense of also, basically, 
sort of setting conventions, could be all conventions that not have to be an international treaties that's deposited in New York at the UN or elsewhere, but it is, you need explicit rules of settlement, legitimate rules of acceptable behavior, and you need, of course, intersubjective yardsticks to be able to measure whether the piece that, that you sign one day is then, of course, applied the next and the day after and even the month after and the year after. And for that to be efficient, and it is necessary to publicize it in the, in the generic sense of the word, make it public to your own public, to the other parties' public, but also to the outside observers and the third parties. And let me then conclude with uh, the fifth element here, which is not a condition, which is just describes this, uh, this uh, approach in terms of a process. There, we, we take the view that uh, is extremely well articulated uh, in Ludwig Wittgenstein's uh, philosophy, where he makes this beautiful analogy between some things that's at the language level between uh, words and, 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 and a city, and a city, and we see it here in, in Engelberg. I was, I was, of course, it's a four-star hotel, so it's better than this one, which is a three-star hotel, which I don't, don't realize, but I'm that beautiful building over there, which is beautiful only when you're inside, because then you'll see this beautiful building here. But when you're in this beautiful building here, you see the Ramada opposite, and that's an ugly building. But the cities are built that way, that you, you do not have sort of a, a grand plan of building a city. You have various accretions over time, various approaches and various uh, styles, and various also usages of the city by various social economic groups and, and elites and so forth. And all this mix, this constitutes language, but a piece is also something like this. It is not something, it is not a sort of simple formula that solves all the, so, solves everything. It is something complex. But at the same time as what it is, the way language comes about, and Wittgenstein's philosophy is useful in that sense, because he reminds us that language and understanding are not in the theoretical activity, if I may say, as just war doctrine or liberal philosophical theory, not in the theoretical activity of interpreting and applying a general theory of distinct cases. No, language is a practical activity uh, of being able to use it in various circumstances, just like in, in John Austin's uh, uh, famous uh, book, or How to Do Things with Words. Well, by that I mean it is, it is the process itself, a dialogical, thin recognition, thick recognition, renouncement rule, you don't go through each and then you go to the next step. You basically sort of move around in that circle, that process, to move forward. In other words, justice process and all this is a dialogical or, or an intercultural dialogue uh, whereby uh, in the parties modify their languages, their identities, and their pictures of the world. So I already mentioned this several times. Unlike just war, in my conclusions, just peace is a formal concept, formal just like Thomas Kuhn's theory of uh, uh, scientific revolutions. Thomas Kuhn does not tell you when a paradigm will be, an old paradigm will be replaced by a new paradigm or displaced or, or revolutionized. No, he, he, he doesn't tell you when and he doesn't tell you how you move from, from classical mechanics to, to, to the world view that, for example, uh, what the ancient Greeks uh, thought in terms of a, of a three-dimensional uh, space here, uh, which is not a good way of approaching things as Albert Einstein showed many years ago. Uh, in other words, it's, it's a form, we also present a formal concept that is at the formal level, that is at the level of the forms, not the content, is a just peace process, is a just peace concept. Why? Because you have, we have heard this throughout this conference here. We have, there are many collective identities in the world, and this is a central defining feature of the world, and also of individuals in the world. We are not world citizens. We are not world citizens. Uh, we, and though those who spoke also spoke from their experiences from Colombia, uh, from Kenya, and so forth, of course we do. 
We do want to reach out, but in the end, we stay Colombian, we stay Kenyan, even if we don't live in Colombia, even if we don't live in Kenya, even if we have to listen to professor taking too much time in Engelberg on a Friday morning. So this is, this is a formal concept we present, and in that sense, what we want to go is beyond, beyond the world in which we are, not in reforming it, but in giving some clearer thoughts to what concepts or what ideas could guide us in the hope of that these ideas become maybe ideologies and uh, in the end have some efficiency in the, in the constant work of finding peace, even though war always looms in our background. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>